If you want to become a chess master, you've probably looked into how to memorize chess openings before. You've heard about other chess players holding hundreds, if not thousands of moves in long-term memory, and you've drooled over the legendary tales of people like Joseph Henry Blackburn demonstrating the knight's tour while blindfolded. And you want this level of skill. Well, memorizing chess openings isn't that difficult. You can use the same techniques to memorize endgame themes and strategies too, and a knight's tour if you want. How, you ask? Well, by using the mnemonic strategies discussed in this video. But be warned, some of the initial steps I'm going to suggest won't seem like they have to do with memory, let alone with chess, but they do. And research shows that they are integral parts of why and how chess masters excel at the game. That's why we'll start with these aspects. But first, if you're new here, make sure to get subscribed, hit that thumbs up, and come visit me at magneticmerrymethod.com. Now, the first step is to exercise your spatial perception. Perceiving space is a cognitive ability that we are born with. However, when it comes to how to memorize chess moves, you want to make sure that your spatial memory for the board is strong. You also want to turn the board into a memory palace. So as a simple exercise, just get out a chessboard. Run your hands along the edges. Get a good sense of its size as a field. And next, measure with your thumb and pointer finger a couple of the squares. Then navigate with your hand held in this shape across the board. This will exercise your sense of where each piece might sit during a game. You can also play out a knight's tour or an expression of Warnsdorf's rule if you want. But don't worry if these exercises sound silly. It's purely spatial memory exercise based on haptic memory findings that have been in use for thousands of years. Now the second thing to do is work with words. So scientists have shown that many chess masters have strong verbal abilities. In fact, using words has been demonstrated as the key way the best players remember multiple moves. And this finding means that instead of trying to remember abstract shapes, players mapped out word-based associations on memory palace journeys patterned on multi-branched trees. And so one obvious way to work with words is to make sure you know your algebraic notation inside out. You'll also want to know your defenses very well, such as the French defense or the Sicilian defense. But these matters aside, generally working on improving your language abilities has proven helpful. So all mnemonics aside, make sure that you're learning a language. And if you add memorizing vocabulary to the mix as you learn that language using mnemonics, all the better because your use of those mnemonics will apply to your use of mnemonics for chess. Now the third thing is to learn the major encoding system. I'm going to suggest that you learn how to memorize numbers in a very specific way to help you mentally label positions so they are easier to memorize. And the classic approach to this simple skill is called the major system. Now if for some reason it doesn't suit you, give the Dominic system a look. I've got a video on that on my channel. And either the major or the Dominic will give you an easy way to associate numbers with words. But if you really want to go for gold, learn a 00 to 99 PAO system. You'll also want to develop your skills with the pegword method. This powerful approach will give you an image for each letter of the alphabet, and we talk about that on the pegword method video. So, how does all this work for chess? Well, let's take something simple for an example, like the double king's pawn opening. To rapidly memorize e4, e5, you would use your images for e, 4, and 5. So in my case, I would see Ernie from Sesame Street pushing a sailboat for four at a seahorse, which represents five. And to remember that both pieces are pawns, both the boat and the seahorse could be pea green or otherwise related to peas. But you don't even actually need to add that step. You can, but you don't need to because the numbers themselves would tell you what the pieces are, right? Now, is that always true? I don't know. It's up to you how you want to play with these techniques. But you can do both. You can have it both ways. You can have the entire board memorized on a square by square basis, and you can have uh, the actual just moves memorized based on the alphabet and the numbers, and you can have the actual names of the pieces incorporated if you want as an additional step, the full names rather than any sort of notation. So remember what I said above about exercising your spatial and verbal memory? This is where those skills start to work in combination with what memory scientists call elaborative encoding. Now here's another example, the Indian defense, D4 and F6. Now based on my personal mnemonics for these letters and numbers, I imagine D Snyder on a sailboat, sailboat is for four, and Neo with a fork and a fish hook for NF6. So if you were to apply this approach to memorize as many chess openings as you wish, you would just simply do the same sort of process. Have images for every number and images for every letter, and then mentally figure this out in your mind and physically think about where this is happening in space. 
And if you've actually gone ahead and touched the chessboard, as I've suggested, you're going to have a much stronger sense. And if you are also memorizing words that you don't know in your mother tongue and learning a language, you're improving that verbal association level that is known to be something that chess masters have. Pretty cool, right? Well, there's more. So the next step I would suggest is study chess imagery in categories. So chess master Nikolai Krogius identified three powerful categories of mental imagery related to chess, and you need to know about these. You'll find them in his book, Psychology in Chess. The categories are retained image, inert image, and forward image. So a retained image is like a ghost or the ugly sister effect. Your memory is basically messing with you because you forget that a piece is no longer somewhere that you remembered it was. And an inert image is the mental state a player adopts when they think they are in a winning position. And so they relax without considering all the ways their strategy could fail. And then finally, a forward image is the ideal image to have. This is when you branch out and consider every possible outcome of the move you wish to make. However, this point may be very, very important to you in the strategies that you use. You don't necessarily want to envision the entire board with all the pieces on it and gradually imagine them being removed. You might prefer to focus just on the key pieces involved in a few moves out. Now, why would that be? Well, because you can't control every response. And even if you could visualize all the pieces in every possible response as some kind of movie where you're forwarding backwards and forwards, you won't be able to afford the time particularly in speed chess. So if you just focus on key pieces, that can be a lot better. And now that you've learned these memory systems and these different categories, try memorizing five to 10 games in their entirety to practice. The more games you know by heart, the more you'll be able to draw on these references when playing your own games. Now you might be wondering, well, which chess openings should you memorize? And there's a number of common and important chess openings that you can consider and you know just go through them one at a time pick one and then move on to the next and the next and the next which order is up to you i would suggest not humming and ha 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 about it just you know alphabetize them if you can't decide or whatever put them all on little slips and draw them from a hat just make sure that you work with all of them. Now, obviously you're gonna to want to supplement your chess memory by also memorizing all of the most common and uncommon defenses to these openings. And now you can. So the next questions that you might have involve memorizing a long sequence of moves and maybe memorizing multiple boards. This is where the Mary Palace technique really shines. So to learn all about it, please consider registering for the free course at magneticmerrymethod.com forward slash YT. And so far we've talked about memorizing individual openings, and these are easy with reference to a single board. But to memorize long sequences, you'll want more space to place your simple associations. And using the Mary Palace, you can sequence them out on a station-by-station -station basis using the method of loci. And as the authors of Blindfold Chess point out, most accomplished chess masters throughout history have combined the Mary Palace with the numbering and letter techniques shared above. So how would this work? Well, it depends on the nature of the game, but some people have suggested that the average chess game involves between 40 to 70 moves. And this would require approximately that amount of stations in a Mary Palace, if not exactly, depending on how you use the Mary Palace technique. And since you can get at least nine moves in any individual room, then most houses will accommodate an entire game. Of course, you can probably get a lot more than nine moves in an individual room. It just depends on how you're using the Mary Palace technique. And of course, you're not gonna memorize the entire chessboard in each location. You'll just be memorizing the notation for each move. And so if you want to memorize multiple boards, no problem. Just use multiple rooms or multiple memory palaces, depending on how you apply the technique. And you know, chess and memory just go together. So when you look into the history of chess, you quickly discover the great chess masters have been into using memory techniques for a very long time. And just look at the board, it is perfectly designed to be a Mary Palace. It has little cells, all of which can be indicated and you can easily just create markers to memorize those. And again, if you add that step of actually touching the board, building your spatial sense of where things are, hold the pieces in your hand, really feel them. This is engaging your haptic memory at a deep, deep level. You're going to do so much better. So as Great as chess is for enhancing mental performance in many areas of life, it's even better with mnemonic training. And it only makes sense to throw in as many brain exercises as you can for good measure, such as the long-term commitment to learning at least one other language well. So at the end of the day, all of the activities we've discussed 
really don't amount to much if you don't actually play chess, right? So I would suggest a variety of game situations, online, in person, against humans, versus the computer, etc. And the more that you do this in the more different situations and contexts as you apply memory techniques to improving your chess knowledge and performance, I'd love to hear how things go for you. And I'd love for you to experiment with actually watching chess games played out and memorizing the moves as they happen in real time, which you can also do. And I'd love to hear how that experiment goes for you. Feel free to post all about it below. In the meantime, thanks so much for being part of the Magnetic Memory Method community. If you're a channel member, thank you so much. If you have any of my books or my programs, I really, really thank you. And uh, everyone on Team Magnetic really, really appreciates it. So until next time, happy gaming and keep yourself magnetic.